afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Tom Butterfield, the outgoing uh, director and founder of the Masterworks Museum. We're in conversation with uh, Laszlo Scherer. On my bottom left and on my bottom right is uh, John Slavin. Uh, and on my upper left is the incoming director, Risa Hunter. Um, and I have known John and Laszlo for an awfully long time, but particularly uh, John. John and I uh, went to the same university in the mid uh, 70s, we went to Ryerson. We were both pursuing photography at that time as a, a medium to uh, make uh, a living out of. Uh, it didn't turn out to too well uh, in my case. Um, having lived in Toronto and doing shows and things like that, I was ready to go back to Bermuda in 1980 and try living on photography and printmaking and uh, Bermuda was not ready for that. So I changed my career, I'm not too sure uh, why and how John's uh, a career changed, but as a result of my doing a museum and collections, uh, it was in 1998 or 99 that I found out that John was into paper conservation and we needed a lot of work done before our, some of our, our artwork was to hit the road. So with John and I united, and then through John, we met uh, Laszlo. And ever since then, uh, both of them have been on the board, uh, supplying me with uh, much needed wisdom and humor uh, and relief uh, and a little bit of levity al along the way because as everybody knows, raising funds, uh, it can be uh, brutal. So having friends in Toronto such as I do, uh, as much as anything else has been a, a terrific asset to, for me. But the one question I have for both of you guys is the following. It occurs to me that we use the word preservation, conservation, and uh, what's the third word? Uh, Restoration. Word? Restoration, that's it, thank you. Mm -hmm. We use them almost interchangeably, yet when we think about it, there are very, very different aspects of, uh, of in a way, the same sort of word we're, we're trying to get away or to support uh, the, the storage and, and hi history of our, of our artwork, of artifacts, paper, whatever it may be. How do you see the words working? John, would you like to begin? No, you go ahead. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, restoration is has the historical connotations and context. So when you hear about restoration, generally the mind goes to the restoration of art, um, or it could be buildings. But there's a, there's a familiarity with that. In Counterpoint to that, we have preservation and conservation. Um, although they should be harmoniously linked, uh, preservation uh, deals with preserving the existing state of something as much as possible. Uh, and by and large, that implies little to no uh, intervention directly on the object itself. Conservation uh, sits in the middle where uh, certain conservation processes can be applied to an object to conserve the uh, material condition state and to stabilize the condition state for its movement into the future. Paper particularly is a, is a very delicate and a very sensitive um, area where the object itself is not ideally structurally altered in any way, but different liquids and chemistries are put into it to clean, to stabilize, to, uh, to deacidify, to bleach. And this takes tremendous hand skills and intuitive skills to, um, along with the scientific knowledge of the weights and measures of how things work. In the context of uh, uh, restoration, uh, it has come to mean the application of a treatment which is intended to rectify or compensate a visually problematic area, whether it's a loss, a damage, um, or um, uh, something that requires um, replacement even possibly. So uh, those are the three 
three sort of distinctions that I bring to um, restoration, conservation, and preservation. Are, are you consciously uh, are working with, with that? I mean, do those words roll through your head all the time about what you're doing? No. <laughs> uh, I mean, in order to communicate the, um, uh, the range and the scope of what it is that we do, I think it's good to have these clarifications of definitions. Um, for me, uh, uh, the words themselves uh, take on meaning when we try to define how it is that we can express ourselves to, to others and in what context. Uh, however, I think the, the most critical feature, and I think John would agree, is to uh, carry forward any vision or uh, intent, motive to touch something for a purpose uh, is to do as little as possible harm uh, to the object as possible. So, um, and then we get into the other categories where preservation seeks really to do very little, if anything, um, but that carries its own risks as well. And this is a whole other topic about managing the risk of things. I mean, you can leave a piece of paper uh, and not touch it because either the skills or the availability to the skills aren't there. Um, and it could just keep deteriorating till it uh, falls apart. Or any kind of uh, remedial treatment will be very difficult and a lot more complicated. So, you know, the, uh, the conservation restoration component, I think is, is very important, uh, but underpinned by this notion that everything that uh, we do should have as little impact as possible. But time does its thing, so things will change. And um, that we have to address at times, just like we have a physical body, art has a physical body as well. And uh, as it ages, it changes. And uh, things, the uh, second law of thermodynamics uh, comes into play and it starts to wanna to fall apart. So what John and I do, if I can speak for John as well, is uh, we're, we're in the central category of, um, uh, of, of the three areas um, that I would sort of generally describe art uh, to fall into in terms of processes. That's creation, the creation of the art by the artist, the maintenance where it comes into the hands of master works or a collector or just uh, someone who appreciates something. And if they don't look after it, things can begin to happen. And if that doesn't um, if that isn't honored, uh, or even if it's just someone is unaware that it needs attention, then there's the destructive component, you know, it will be destroyed. So in the case of masterworks, the important feature here, yes, is preservation. Um, and uh, that the gallery itself really has taken in these absolutely remarkable objects from all over the world that have to do with Bermuda and maybe a few that don't, but you know, it's, it's all about Bermuda here. And uh, these things need to be cared for and maintained. So now that Tom, you've done this remarkable thing and, and Risa, you've taken this on as uh, in, in the continuum of the history of Masterworks, um, there will be this need to look after these objects, not necessarily from the standpoint of conservation per se, but certainly out of preservation, which will entail the identification of potential problems or uh, at least their, um, the awareness of where these, um, these objects reside in their, in their lives. Okay. 
And I think, you know, especially in Bermuda, we have so many environmental factors that, um, that mean that, you know, going forward, that will be a big focus area for me is, is preserving a collection that is, you know, you know, in an environment that, that we control as much as we can, but, you know, it, it is Bermuda and we, we have different, you know, humidity factors and, um, you know, our, our, our buildings are structured differently. Um, so there are a number of things at play just in terms of how we preserve and how that is distinct from maybe other places like Canada or the U.S., um, drier conditions. So, um, so it is a, a big focus area for us um, for sure. And John, actually, I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. um, how did you get into this field? I mean, you know, I, we just heard Tom talk about the fact that you two had connected at some point, you know, maybe many moons ago at Ryerson, but, um, but how exactly did you get into the field of conservation work? Well, uh, as Tom said, we studied photography at Ryerson in the late 70s. And uh, following that, I did uh, work in photography, and, but I also worked uh, with some people doing perceptual science. And there is kind of this interesting dynamic between my doing photography, uh, which was purely artistic, and also doing these experiments and how people perceive things in order to figure out uh, the psychology and the physiology behind vision. And I was doing that at York University at the time, but uh, at also I was traveling uh, quite a lot and uh, with my interest in art, I was going to a lot of museums. And when you do that in Europe for the first time, which I was, you uh, go to museums, which of course have old collections or in old buildings. And uh, in Europe, there's a huge focus on what uh, restoration has achieved in terms of their collections in terms of the buildings, etc., And that whole emphasis on restoration is something I had not been aware of in the past, uh, given the fact that I'm a Canadian uh, in a country that's only a little over 200 years old. Uh, there's not much really here to restore. And uh, certainly when we do it, we don't really uh, promote it very much because it doesn't seem to be something that's very significant in our lives or culture. But uh, those trips through Europe really got me interested in conservation. And uh, that's when I decided it would be perfect for me because uh, my, I think my skills, my whole mindset is oriented towards uh, what you need in order to do restoration work or conservation work. Uh, I've been copying pictures since I was four years old. Uh, I was never very good at doing original art, but anything that I thought was a decent picture, I would could do a perfect copy of. I was forging tickets and uh, coupons and things for my friends in order to get into concerts. Uh, I just loved doing that kind of work and I was good at it. So uh, it's actually the perfect fit. That's fraudulent. That's fraudulent. <laughs> and, and you love that. I thought you were an honest broker. Hey, a guys got to make a living. <laughs> <laughs> So, I love, so do yeah, see, I love the honesty. <laughs> so do you see the preservation? Because you, you mentioned, Laszlo, that uh, you know, time is the big, the big factor. So do you see, both of you, the, 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 your, part of your process is to slow the aging process down of objects? John? <laughs> uh, well, you can never stop it, that's for sure. But yeah, you can definitely make things last longer by looking after them. Absolutely. And what I wanted to uh, make sure people who don't really understand what we do know is that uh, conservation brings together these interests and expertise from two areas that never come together, and that's science and art. And if you don't have sufficient expertise in both of those areas, you're not going to do a very good job at preserving things because you have to understand the art, what it's about, what the artist has created and how he's done it. But you also have to understand how materials deteriorate over time. You really have to understand organic chemistry. You have to know how those materials deteriorate and what conditions they do deteriorate, how those conditions can accelerate or decelerate deterioration and what you can do to rectify deterioration when you encounter it or stabilize it. 
And uh, of course, uh, bringing those two areas together is difficult. People are usually have a, a lean towards either the arts or towards the sciences. But uh, I find our field is, is pretty interesting in that those two have to come together and you have to really be good at both in order to uh, make sure you're doing uh, the work that's necessary to stabilize things and they have a long future. Yes, and, and just to further that, I mean, John, John said that beautifully. And, you know, the, what we do as conservators is, is, is fundamentally unnatural. You know, there, there's generally in objects, uh, let's, let's not speak about the accidental damages that occur, but um, uh, the mechanical damages, but the actual um, uh, structure of an object can have um, characteristics chemically, materially, that um, accelerate its deterioration. And as John said, you know, we, we do try to uh, decelerate this process to maximize its continuum. I mean, if art serves anything, it, it, it serves the expression of the human spirit. And I can't imagine how we would have any sense of our humanity without the things that we've been able to reference uh, about things from 10,000 years ago, a thousand years ago, even 50 years ago, like in Canada. Um, you know, these, these are all part of the, the mechanism of, um, um, of the human experience on this planet. And uh, uh, so, yes, I think, you know, bringing together all of those um, uh, really quite uh, learned um, aspects from the arts and the sci sciences uh, to explore, to penetrate what problems can be rectified, not stopped, not arrested, but decelerated for a longer time uh, uh, with us. I think that's, that's, uh, that's a large undertaking. Uh, and it takes many, many, many years of experience uh, to develop the appreciation for the art, uh, the knowledge for the science, um, and finding a, the bridges that it takes to bring them together and to care for these things, uh, not just from the head, but from the heart as well. You're almost like the plastic surgeons of the art world, right? <laughs> the <laughs> science and... <laughs> <laughs> making wow. sure the pixels don't show, right? <laughs> That's the restoration side. Yeah, 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 yeah. true, true. Yeah. <laughs> so in terms of, you know, I'm sure with every single painting that you get, um, Laszlo, I know you work more with oils and John, you work more with, with drawings and paperworks. Um, but is there a typical process that you follow or is it really case by case and you know, how long does it take you? I'm, I'm just curious because I'm sure a lot of people, including myself, um, don't know enough about what that exact work looks like. Like what, what would be the process from getting the painting to being like, okay, it's ready to go. And we can send it back to that museum or that collector. Well, this, is, this goes to the heart of what John just said, um, uh, was looking at the art, having an appreciation for it. Um, having some sort of um, need to explore its meanings. Uh, artist intent is one of the, the difficult ones. You know, because how did you know what the artist intended? What I can tell you is that everything the artist intended is in front of me when there's something there in the process and the material. You know, the activity is all there and every one of those moments, every stroke, every you know, whether it's on a painting or a, a drawing, uh, every moment was a conscious moment that was put there by the artist. Mm -hmm. And there needs to be this um, awareness, uh, uh, a vision when you see something without appreciation, it becomes purely technical. And 
uh, I've never related to music that's technical. I've heard some absolutely remarkable musicians that are technically amazing, but um, they don't move me, mm-hmm. you know? And it's that kind of thing where if, if a conservator, a restorer can't look at something and appreciate its beauty, something about it that uh, drives them there, then how are they going to make decisions? The technical decisions, you know, you got a board, you got a saw it in half, you get a saw and you measure it and you cut it. Well, that's technical, but why are you doing it? And so uh, in terms of time, I think, you know, as, as John knows well also, um, you know, with time comes um, um, uh, the opportunity for precision. And precision rarely happens um, by ruminating endlessly and uh, spending countless hours on, um, on mysteries. I think there comes a point where uh, a diagnosis has to be made. And that's the key in anything, whether it's medicine, in, in anything. The diagnosis, looking inside, gnosis of meaning knowledge and diagnosis, you know, giving these perspectives of, of how we understand something. I think once we see that and we have made those judgments about its, um, its uh, artistic values and meanings relative to what we've put into our understanding of things over many decades, that leads us to uh, resolving whatever it is that's in front of us, whether it's a painting or a piece of paper torn in half and what we do and how we do it or something much more subtle and, uh, and less visible. And in terms of time, in some cases, it can take an awfully long time. Um, and in some cases, uh, very complex treatments can be done with precision and velocity. I won't say speed. You know, because there's a lot of things that come into it. Uh, Whenever you've d- done a, 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 a cleaning, have you ever come across an artwork where someone has uh, overpainted uh, or painted out something that, that's behind it? And do you reach the owner and say, this is what I've discovered? And you then you either A, cover it up or B, leave it exposed? Yes. I mean, that, that happens on occasion. And... Uh, uh, I wouldn't say rarely, it's not uncommon, but what is uncommon is when uh, there are things of, of, of great value that, uh, that this has been done to. Um, but yes, I mean, there, there are steps to take and it's just like when you go in to get a biopsy or exploratory surgery, you know, you, you gotta go in there to see it. And yes, if it's removed and the client, it was very important in this picture because, um, it's, you know, to respect the client's wishes and their relationship to the object is, is paramount. I mean, they're the ones that are bringing this to you, you know, to the al- altar of sacrifice, maybe. But um, uh, yes, in, in, in my case, um, I can certainly uh, reintegrate those areas that have been uh, removed if the client really doesn't like where it's going. That can be done. Uh, and uh, ideally without uh, damaging anything that's underneath, but it certainly if you're removing something on top, that will be gone and can be compensated again. So there's so many variables of decision-making in all of this. And, you know, in the case of, um, of a client, a collector, a museum, a gallery, um, they have certain input as well. And that needs to be respected. I may not agree, but I have my, uh, my criteria by which I can say, well, no, I'm not going to do this. And I'm sure John's done that as well. You know, this is not something we're going to pursue because it will be uh, damaging, harmful, hurtful uh, for a variety of reasons. So it, it's really on a case by case basis, as you were referring to earlier, there's no sort of there, there are general treatment protocols that can be applied, but they all need to be able to shift. Mm-hmm. You know, there needs to be a, 
a, a protein shift that uh, happens during treatment. And um, that's the awareness component of, uh, of not only doing something to a treatment, but being aware um, how it progresses and ideally to see the problems before they become fully formed. Mm -hmm. So as, as simple, you know, it's like, it's, it's like cooking. Cooking is, is very, very much the same. Mm -hmm. You know, you can make a great dish and the next day, if you're not paying attention, it doesn't turn out so good. So that leads me to another question though. Um, just as you say, cooking is uh, there's sort of a, a formula to it. Do you ever sort of alter some of your formulas given uh, the, the condition, either um, uh, brutal or not so, no, not so brutal, uh, a treatment that might be, uh, might be needed? Do you alter those so you can make a heavier or lighter solution to uh, whatever uh, work you're, you know, the application is going on? Well, in, in, in this particular case, you know, I, uh, what I've asked interns before, what, what do they like doing more, baking or cooking? Um, and depending on what they answer, I reveal to them what I'm looking for in that. And, you know, the baking component requires, you know, fairly straightforward um, adherence to ingredients, to processes, um, baking times, all that stuff. Cooking is very different. And um, which doesn't mean that because you have certain formulas uh, that uh, you have to stay by them uh, slavishly. Uh, I think, you know, they can certainly be altered. And I'm sure it's the same in paper too, where you have to go in the right direction and then be able to make the adjustments accordingly. So um, uh, I tend not to work by formula. Um, I tend to look at things and uh, and develop a dialogue with the object and the object lets me know what it needs relative to uh, the relationship that we establish. It, it sounds kind of personal and it is because it, uh, otherwise if, if, if I don't know what, um, uh, what it's going to disagree with, if, if, um, if we have a positive relationship, it can show me things that I can respond to. Otherwise, um, um, I just do things over and over again, which I find really, really tiresome. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. and I'm curious, how has technology changed your restoration, conservation, preservation work? Has it changed it at all over the years as you look at your career and you know how, how it was when you started and what it's offering you now, or has there not really been that much change? Because like you said, Laszlo, it is such a personal experience that, that really, you know, you, you need the human touch versus some sort of machine behind the scenes. John? Well, I would say that uh, in the 30 years I've been working, there has been change in terms of both technology and in particular, I'd say chemistry. Mm -hmm. uh, but there hasn't been a lot, not a lot of dramatic change, but significant change, I would say. Um, there is some equipment that we tend to use pretty regularly now that didn't exist when I first started in conservation in the 90s. Things like suction tables for drawing solvents through objects in order to clean them. Um, it's pretty advanced technology that uh, only came about in the late 80s. Uh, but most of the changes I would say have been in what chemistry we've, we're using <clears throat> to deal with uh, issues of cleaning uh, objects and uh, consolidating them. Uh, there are a lot of new synthetic adhesives out there which uh, can be used in certain situations uh, that are quite advantageous to older things that we were using. And there are some chemicals which are very advantageous for cleaning that we didn't used to use before, but the science now shows that they're quite good to use now. And uh, a lot of us are adapting and using them. And you do have to stay on top of these changes. They're good changes. And uh, uh, it, it's uh, so exciting when you've 
got new possibilities for controlling what you're doing and getting a, a result that's uh, perhaps more stable, more satisfactory than what we could in the past. But we never forget about materials that artists and even restorers were using 500 years ago and how good they were then and uh, how well they've stood up and how we can still use them today in order to get the results we want. So uh, we've got a healthy respect for what's been done in the past, uh, but we also try to stay on top of any new developments. They're not a lot, but they are significant. Yeah, agreed. And, you know, certainly, uh, you know, and I've known John for a long time and, and I think we both have sort of in our own way come to understand that there's a big difference between confidence and clarity. And anytime we can get something that, um, that can do something better or something that just hasn't been done before and now can be done um, is something worth considering uh, to embrace in treatment. Um, and it certainly gives us, um, again, uh, when it, it's an instrument, a simple thing like an ultraviolet light can give us so much information. Even a simple thing like putting a flat object, whether it's paper or painting in tangential or raking light can give us so much information. The thing is to look at things differently so that we can have a, a, a clarity of, of how we can proceed. And John is right, you know, there's not a lot of things in terms of, of the skills component, which has changed. You know, you can't give this to machines. And um, as much as I'm sure um, people might think that it's possible, I, I just don't see it. There's too much of a relationship. And, you know, the other thing uh, to say there too, is that in order to become really good at at having the the hand, mind, and eye skills for this kind of work, it's not enough to know what materials or or instruments to use. What is exponentially more important is how you use them. And this is something that can't be replaced, you know. And um, I see this more and more over time where, um, you know, there has been an attrition, a loss of skills, but I think it's coming back again. The pendulum is swinging. Young people are getting more interested in the treatment of engaging and actually the, doing the work. And uh, um, John, I know, you know, has, has provided a, a wonderful internship. Um, I've tried to provide um, internships as well over the years. And, uh, uh, but it's the skills that are important that they not be lost because there is a tremendous insight into all of these new uh, chemistries and instruments that come to uh, give us, again, a better vision of what it is that we're dealing with. Um, so, yeah. Well, John and Laszlo, I'm just conscious of time. Um, and so Tom just wanted to see before we wrap up, if you have any other questions. I got, I got so many, I don't even know where to start. I mean, this is- I know, I know. It's almost yeah. like we need a part two. <laughs> well, yeah, it is because, you know, there's, there's, you know, what advice might you give to people at, at home? Uh, can these two gentlemen, for, whether it's in oil or paper, from a photograph, see what might be needed in the way of, of uh, you know, restorative work? Uh, for, for the owner rather than having the necessity of taking it out of a frame and shipping it across. There are all these other uh, things that, uh, that you've done. And one thing that I do remember, uh, and both John and Laszlo separately did uh, 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 two works that uh, are etched in my brain. And I'm hoping that we might be able to find the record of them. And that is, John, you restored uh, a, the SS Trinidad at a New York dock. That was a work on paper. The, the, the paper of which was as bright red as the sun as the sunset itself, and somehow you were able to take that out. And Laszlo, you did a work uh, of uh, by Thomas Driver of 1810 oil in 1821, where when you cleaned it, there were ships uh, at bay that were, they were wrecks, they were hulks, 
that we hadn't seen before because of the, uh, the layering of uh, smoke that was uh, over the top of it. I mean, it was just a revelation to, uh, to look at that painting. Bo in both cases, they were completely different uh, works and uh, new to our uh, way of looking at, uh, at the image that, uh, that left uh, Bermuda. Uh, I'm sure you recall seeing them, both of you. Do you had, did you sort of do a, you did a before and after, but did you do a during uh, in any of those uh, images, do you know? Oh, well, sure, I would have had some photographs. I've got photographs and uh, I'm happy to get together and do this again and roll up our sleeves and uh, get our hands dirty looking at art and what we've done. Okay. If you want to be. <laughs> That would be great. That would be great. I'd love that. I really would love that. Okay. And I think that there are a lot of people, if we, we let our membership know that they'll be able to see that, uh, then maybe we, we line our questions along that, what they can learn with the artwork that they have on their walls. Because heat and humidity in Bermuda is, and, and John, on that note, uh, Elise was given uh, the oldest, uh, or the museum was, the oldest newspapers to be found on this island. Um, and they go back. 200 years plus, and my question obviously will become later, what should we do it? How do we preserve them to make sure that we can hand these papers down uh, in posterity and why the, uh, the cockroaches uh, didn't get high on the ink and the, uh, and the paper, I have no idea. <laughs> okay, well, let's try and figure that out next time. Let's have another meeting. Okay. Yep, we'll sort right. it out. Well, Laszlo, okay. John, thank you so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. and. Until Glad next time, we'll do a round two.